her sisters. Her sisters. Friends, it's great to have all of you here. Just by show of hands, how many of you were here for the last lecture? That's what we call good retention. How many of you were not here for the last lecture? Please raise your hand. Do not feel guilty. Okay. So, you know, this reminded me about the, uh, the empty seats up front. There are two uh, teachers in my yeshiva, in my alma mater. One of the teachers, one of the, uh, one of the deans, when you would come to his class, all the front seats were taken. The empty seats were the, if you came late, that's where you sat. The other one, all the back seats were taken, the front seats were empty. So try to understand why that was uh, the case. Today I'm a little bit nervous because um, I have a very special audience. It's always a special audience, but um, it's a very intimidating audience for me. I have my grandmother, who was here last time. I have my parents, my father and my mother. So please, any criticism about me, any Lush and Hara, please uh, keep it for another time. This is not, this is not the time to, uh, to share your constructive criticisms. Uh, th there will be a different format for conversation. <sighs> My wife and... As a wise man once said, I only fear the Almighty and my wife. <laughs> and my dear aunt. So um, welcome all of you. <clears throat> Friends, trustees, members, future members. Um, welcome to Parkey Synagogue. We're so happy to have this series. We're continuing on a journey. The journey is the battle for Israel's soul religion and state through the eyes of Israel's chief rabbis. Last week we spoke about Rav Kook. Rav Kook was a very formative figure in the foundation of the chief rabbinate. There's a lot of discussion going on about the chief rabbinate, and we'll delve into it a little bit today together. This class is dedicated for the speedy recovery of Chaim Dov ben Risa Shoshana. Uh, may he have a speedy recovery, and may all those who seek a Rav uh, be able to have it as well. Last, last lecture, I gave the credits at the end, and I think it's more appropriate to give it in the beginning. Um, so these are some of the people whose doctorates, books, uh, essays, um, some of the people I had phone conversations with in preparation for this lecture. Dr. Shulamit Eliash, Professor Neria Gutel, Dr. Moshe Hershkowitz, Rabbi Menachem Burstein, Yaakov and Chaim Herzog, um, their books, Heichal Shlomo Archives, Masual Yitzchak, which was a book uh, um, published for the 50th anniversary of his passing, Rabbi Dr. Itamar Varhaftik, Dr. Isaac Herzog Jr., and Rabbi Zvulun Harlap. So I thank all of them in advance, those who are alive and those who are not, those whose books I've read, and I hope to do justice to a very special individual. What is this? Uh, you know, many people called me up in, in, in shul over the last two weeks and said, Rabbi, I heard your lectures are great. Um, but I'm in Aruba, I'm in Miami, I'm in Israel, I'm in Italy. Um, do you mind sending me the recorder? So it reminded me of a story. There was one of the uh, rabbis in my yeshiva in Lakewood. He would come to a class. He would have about 10 students in the class and about 30 tape recorders. People would come put a tape recorder, press, press play, and then leave and pick up the tape recorder after class. <laughs> The story goes that one time he showed up to give the class and all he saw was 30 tape recorders. <laughs> He's thinking for a moment what to do, he wasn't sure. He takes out a tape recorder out of his pocket, presses play and leaves. <laughs> so we want to do it live, we want people engaging and hopefully we'll have a tape recorder on afterwards. Some of the questions we're going to discuss, we're gonna start talking about them more today and we'll continue more in the next lecture. Is Israel a Jewish or a democratic state? Could those two be together? What are your thoughts? Jewish, raise your hand. Democratic, raise your hand. More Jewish or more democratic? <laughs> more Jewish. Oh. I think it's a Jewish democratic. That's a non-easy balance. We're, we're battling with it for a very long time. 
what is the Israeli status quo? Now, status quo is the status quo, but when you say in Israel the status quo, the religious status quo, there is a religious status quo that exists since the days of the British Mandate. We will discuss what exactly that is. What are some of the contentious issues in Israel, especially from the, from the days of its inception? The army draft. What's so controversial about the army draft? Who doesn't want to go to the army? Okay, last week I used the term ultra-orthodox. Two people walked over to me and told me not to use it. So I'll use the term charedon. When you say it in Hebrew, it's okay. You know, if you say it in Yiddish, it's not, it's not a dirty word. It's fine. So the, ultra, the yeshiva students, that's number one. Number two, there's a huge debate about um, women drafting to the IDF. Conversions. Oh, is that an issue? Yes. Welcome. The personal status, personal status which means marriage, divorce, uh, anything pertaining to that, in Israel it's still it's under the control of the chief rabbinate. If you want to get married um, civilly in Israel, that is impossible. The one way to get married civilly in Israel is to do what? Is Dr. Michael Reich says it's Cyprus. You could go anywhere, but Cyprus is the closest place. You go there, you come back. If you get married civilly in a different country, you could come back to the state of Israel. Okay, last week we concluded the death of Rav Kook, 1935. Rav Kook, who's the visionary, who really lays the foundation for religious Zionism, saying that Zionism is not a contradiction necessarily to Jewish traditional values. The opposite. This is part of the messianic process. He dies. He has a group of students and a group of followers. And the person, so what are we discussing now? Succession. Who's going to be the next rabbi after Rav Kook? <coughs> and the natural successor for Rav Kook is Rav Yaakov Moshe Chalap. He's heading his yeshiva. He's a, a very close student since Rav Kook became the rabbi of Jaffa in 1904. And the one who's going to run against him is Chief Rabbi Isaac Herzog from Ireland. Now, Rabbi Herzog, as I told you last in the last lecture, Rav Kook is really not a modern Orthodox rabbi. He's a religious Zionist rabbi. Rav Herzog, you may call, if you want to use that term, modern Orthodox and Rav Herzog, you could use that. And when the election is up between Rav Yaakov Moshe Chalap, who is a devout student of Rav Kook and Dr. Rabbi Dr. Isaac Herzog. The combination of Rabbi Dr. is extremely unfamiliar, especially for the old Yeshuv, especially for the traditional communities in Israel. This is a person who studied in Sorbonne and in a few other places, and we'll discuss it in a moment. It's a very close race. Rabbi Herzog defeats him 37 to 31 votes. And the Peshkevils, if you remember, we discussed that Rav Kook had a huge opponent by the name of Rav Zunfeld. Rav Zunfeld called him, you're naive. You think that the Zionists, who were at this point extremely atheistic, the leaders of the Zionist movement are extremely anti-religious. You think there is any place of working together with them? This is wrong. So the supporters of Rav Kharlap, as my father told me, put out a, a pishkavil. You know what's a pishkavil? So today you have something called social media shaming. Before that, you had something called Pishkevils. Pishkevils is a piece of paper that contains a very gentle message to its opponent, and it's thrown out in the streets of Jerusalem or Bnei Brak a few minutes before Shabbos. Why is it thrown out a few minutes before Shabbos? Because you can't clean it out on Shabbos. So you want to shame someone, you put someone's name, you say he's a heretic, he's a shagitz, you print it out and you throw it out on the streets. And when people walk on Shabbos to shul, they see your name and they see how bad of a person you are. So they put out Peshkevils saying that if, if Dr. Herzog will win this election, this proved that Rabbi Zonenfeld was right, that we were too naive. This is where it's going. This is a downhill. This is the slippery slope. You know what's slippery slope? This is it. A Rabbi Dr. Oyve. Let's go a little bit to the life. Who's Rabbi Herzog? This is a very different story from Rav Kook. Rav Kook comes from poverty, comes from uh, a small town in Latvia. Rav Kook also starts in Lamja, which is Eastern Europe. But he has a very different upbringing, and we'll find out in a second. He's born in 1888. Lamja is a pretty big town. And again, from a young age, he's already discovered as a brilliant child. When uh, great speakers and rabbis come to speak in town, 
when he was eight, nine years old, people said of him that he could have repeated a one hour lecture in Talmud and repeat it word to word from what he heard. Again, could I tell you exactly if it was true? But again, no one said that about me. So, <laughs> his father is Rabbi Yoel Herzog. Rabbi Yoel Herzog, um, again, being a rabbi, as we discussed in Eastern Europe at the end of the 19th century, is not so much fun. Um, it's not so much fun in many other places in the world either, but <laughs> I'm not going to commiserate too much tonight. So don't do that. Rabbi Yoel Herzog gets a job in England. He leaves, he leaves uh, Eastern Europe, he goes to England in, in 1897. Rabbi Herzog is a little boy of nine years old. So which means he's, he's growing up, he's not growing up in the shtetl. He's growing up in the United Kingdom. Rabbi Herzog speaks a beautiful English. And then uh, you'll see later uh, beautiful Irish English. In Hebrew, you say autodidact. How do you say it in English? Autodidact? Self-taught. He's self-taught. Rav Kook went to Volazhin, which is the, um, the mother of the yeshiva world, which is the, uh, so to say, the making place of great scholars. Rav Herzog pretty much studies on his own. He studies from his father, but very much he grows, he grows into the human being he becomes. Very much this is a very a lonely journey for him. He's in touch via writing. And it's very interesting. He's in touch with the Ridvaz, who, uh, uh, who was a great rabbi. He was later a rabbi in Safed. The Ridvaz actually happens to be one of the rabbis who attacked Rav Kook for being too lenient during the Shemitah. He said, you can't just sell the Shemitah like you sell the Chametz, you can't sell the lands to the Arabs. And it, he took a very, um, you know, more of a right-wing approach. Now, what's good about writings, correspondence, you don't see the person. It's not clear what these two great scholars knew about the personal life of, of Herzog, but they had enormous amounts of respect for him. I'm not sure they knew he went to university. Maybe they did, maybe they did not. But when the Ritva sees the writings of young Herzog, he says, we did not have someone like this since Rabbi Akiva Eger. Rabbi Akiva Eger is one of the most brilliant uh, uh, scholars, uh, which wrote one of the most brilliant works on the Talmud and, and others. He gets a few rabbinic ordinations, not from an institution, but from these rabbis, his father, and one other ordination. His father is invited to Paris. How many of you have been in the synagogue in Rue Pavé 10? We have a few Parisians here. This is a synagogue of Russian immigrants who arrive in Paris. They build a beautiful synagogue. It's, the synagogue actually exists till this very day. His father becomes the rabbi. And again, you have to understand. You have to look at the people's upbringing. If you grew up in a small shtet in Latvia, that's one story. When you grow up in Paris, it's a different story. 1914, what happens in 1914? World War I. World War I. He goes to the Sorbonne University. He gets many degrees. He goes to university in Leeds. He goes to university, some he attends in person, some through correspondence. He attends the Sorbonne. Now in the Sorbonne, he gets a PhD in, in what? What subject? Marine biology. Rav Herzog speaks 12 languages on a level of a mother tongue. Just that so you understand the level of intellectual greatness we're speaking about over here. He speaks fluent Latin, he speaks fluent Greek, uh, he got degrees in the uh, Semite languages, okay? You s use the word Torah, Mada, Torah, and science. You could very much say that about Rav Herzog. Rav Herzog believes there are two ways you could see God's divinity in this world. There's one that's universal and one that's particular. The particular way to see God's divinity is through the Torah, that's the Jewish a revelation that we believe in, and the universal way to see God in this world is through science. And this very much starts to shape who he is, and we'll see through different points of his life how that affects the leader he becomes. This is a very much, he wrote a lot about the Maimonidian, uh, uh, the Rambam's approach, and about his relationship to sciences. This is uh, one of the first books he puts out, the Hebrew, can you read that word? 
Some people say it's English, but I'm not sure. <laughs> but again, you have to know Latin and Greek to make sure you know what's happening exactly. His PhD surrounds the Tehillet. What is the Tehillet? Titus. How many? What color is your titus? Titus is white. Now, if you when you say the Shema, a kanaf ptil tchelet, one of the strings of the tzitzit has to be blue, royal blue, turquoise. Turquoise. What what color exactly is it? So what's so special? So when did we lose this color tchelet? Which fish does it come from? Eastern European Jews say it comes from the gefilte fish. <laughs> but what's so special about this PhD? First of all, is the combination of talents he needs to use. Number one is history. He uses chemistry. He, study, he studies marine biology in order to be able to discover the fish that they used the dye for the trelet. He has to discover at what point did the Jewish people stop using the trelet. And his assumption is it's after, during the times of the Talmud, since it's not mentioned that you don't have, it means you still uh, have a trelet. During the time of the Sivoraim in Babylon, that's when we lose uh, the um, tradition. We're speaking about 500, it's sometimes after 560 CE. Um, Rav Achai uh, already um, and the Shiltot already mentions that there's no Tchelet. So sometime between 560 C and 700 C, uh, we lose the Tchelet. Now what's so special about this work? He's using science, again, uh, to discover things about Judaism. But what other aspect is so daring about his, his work? Is that he's not scared to tackle new issues. Now listen, there are two different type of questions you could be answering when it comes to Jewish law. You could be answering the same questions you got last year. Is this kosher for Pesach or is it not? Is the chicken kosher or is it not kosher? That's one type of question. But then you have new questions. Then you have new questions that are really old questions that you have to rediscover. Why is this so important? Well, if you'll be the first chief rabbi of the state of Israel, after 2,000 years that the Jewish people did not have a state, all the Jewish laws that pertain running a state have not been an exercise for 2,000 years. This is a person who has to rediscover those laws. And in his PhD in Tchelis, he starts on that journey of not being scared to tackle new subjects that are really millennia old. He becomes a rabbi. He's still single, okay? He becomes a rabbi in Belfast, in Ireland. Now, it's a fascinating time in Ireland. What's happening in Ireland during this time? The IRA. Who knows what's the IRA? Not the IR, IRS. Don't, don't leave the room. The IRA. So he becomes the rabbi of Belfast. While he's the rabbi of Belfast, he makes the most important decision of his life. He marries Sarah Hillman. Sarah Hillman is also a daughter of a rabbi, a daughter of a Russian rabbi who moved uh, to the West. Her father was also a great scholar, wrote many books. His name was Rav Shmuel Yitzhak Hillman. He actually moved to Israel also. He, he lived um, a, a, you know, near of Herzog in Jerusalem as he, uh, as he um, grew older. She's, Sarah Herzog really, as her grandson, who I spoke to today, Dr. Isaac Herzog, told me that without Sarah Herzog, Rav Herzog was really dysfunctional in a way. So you're speaking about a genius who speaks 12 languages, has a few PhDs, um, knows the Torah to its... He's a master in all subjects of Torah. For people, you know, you know, sometimes you say, some, you know, if you're a rabbi doctor, you may not be such a great rabbi, not such a great doctor. There was one rabbi doctor, they said, you know, at least the rabbis say, at least he's a good doctor. The doctors say, at least he's a good rabbi. <laughs> but someone to be able to be a great, you know, scholar of secular studies and of Judaic studies and so many different, uh, the humanities and the sciences is really fascinating. She becomes his life partner, and we'll discuss a little bit. This woman, in a way, many people say she was the real first chief rabbi of the state of Israel. Uh, many of the rabbis who got hired were based on her decision. The rabbis who were applying for jobs to be in the Supreme Rabbinic Court knew that it's not enough to impress Rabbi Herzog. If Sarah Herzog did not like who you are, forget about getting a job. You know, there's another Sarah in Israel today that uh, people say is very powerful. <laughs> I'm not going to discuss that. 
Sarah Herzog has many, um, many talents. She's a brilliant woman also. You can read in Hebrew. She believes women have to have a profession, have to have financial dependence. Now this is a woman saying this in 19... Um, in 1917, okay? Wow. This is, uh, you know, most countries in the West, women still, uh, many countries still, women can't vote. This does not contradict to the famous phrase of, you know, women are supposed to be, you know, hidden uh, in the background. To the promotion of women in our generation, it's an important aspect of, uh, of what we consider a religious woman today. She's involved, she's uh, connected, and she lets her voice be heard. You should not think a woman's job is to stay at home. You should not think that a woman should sit at home and with her hands crossed. The first chief rabbi, the first chief rabbi of Israel. Okay? 1919, he becomes the chief rabbi of Dublin. Some call him the Sinn Féin Rebbe. What's the Sinn Féin? The Sinn Féin is the movement which it's a pretty much anti-Semitic movement that starts uh, 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 to rejuvenate Irish independence. As Sarah Herzog said, some people never saw a nation claim its independence. I was lucky to see two nations claim their independence. Now, the Irish are fighting against the British, the Catholics and the Protestants. You all heard the famous joke about the Jew who gets caught in the, in the middle. You heard the joke? No. A Jew gets caught in Ireland and missed a fight. And bandits are coming to him and say him, are you a Catholic or a Protestant at gunpoint? He says, I'm a Jew. He says, but are you a Jewish Catholic or a Protestant Catholic? Are you, are, are you a Catholic Jew or a Protestant Jew? Jews always get in the middle of the fight. Um, but what's interesting is that he builds a relationship with Imon de Valera. Remember this name. He later becomes the president and uh, leader of Ireland. While he's in hiding in, the, in 1919, 1920, 1921, one of his hiding places is at the home of the chief rabbi of Ireland. You know, you look at the rabbi's home, what are you going to find? You're going to find some chametz uh, sale documents, what are you going to find there? He would hide in the home of Rav Herzog. Remember this name because we're going to come back to it. It's a very important name in his life. Rav Herzog gives one of his most, uh, one of the greatest speeches of his life. Uh, Ireland wants to ban the Shechita. And Rav Herzog gives a speech in the parliament. Again, using his knowledge of science to prove that the Shechita is a very humane way of slaughter. And he's successful. Not only that he's successful, the Irish parliament prints a notebook of his speech and, uh, and it gives it out. Now we're coming back to where we started from. He's chosen as the chief rabbi of Israel. The traditional place for the chief rabbi of Israel to give their inauguration speech is the Horva Synagogue. The Horva Synagogue is a story, it's a lecture on its own. It was built, it was broken. Uh, how many of you have saw this arch in the old city of Jerusalem? The picture in the bottom is the way it looks like today. He gives his inauguration sermon. And there are two points from his inauguration sermon that I think are essential to understand what kind of rabbi he will be. He's already a rabbi. He quotes from Zechariah chapter 3. Thus said the Lord of hosts, if you walk in my paths and keep my charge, you in turn will rule my house and guard my courts. What's the difference between house and courts? Rav Herzog says, the house is Israel, the courts is the diaspora Jewry. I'm not just going to focus as the chief rabbi of Israel, just what's the interest that starts in Tel Aviv and ends in Jerusalem. I care for the diaspora Jewry. This is the courtyard, even though we're at the home, we cannot forget the courtyard that leads into Jerusalem. That's from his inauguration speech in 1937. Another fascinating point he says at his inauguration point, he says that a king had to have two Torah scrolls. It's a, a quote from the Talmud and Dream 21b. He writes one scroll as does any Jew. There's a mitzvah for every single Jew to write a Torah scroll or buy one if you don't have the time to write it. He writes one scroll and 
as does a, and he writes an additional scroll because he's a king. And this is as it is taught in the Brighter, that he shall write himself a second Torah scroll. This teaches that he writes for the sake two scrolls, one that goes out and comes in with him at all times, and one that is placed in his treasury. He says a rabbi has two jobs. One is spiritual. One is Yiddishkeit. One is teaching Torah. One is caring about the spirituality of the Jewish people. But then there is another job, and that's caring for the well-being of the Jewish people. There is a Torah that's in, in home, and there's a Torah that goes with you wherever you go. And he wants to be a very proactive chief rabbi. He's not just going to sit there and use his official responsibilities. Now who's at this time in Israel? Who's running the show? British. You have the British, you have the Arabs, and you have the Sochnut, the heads of the, the Yeshuv HaKadash. And it's interesting, the British want to have a chief rabbinate. The Sochnut, which does not really want a chief rabbinate, but they need to have a chief rabbinate. And they do not want the chief rabbi being involved in any political issues. Stay in shul, focus on what you gotta do, let us run the country. Well, they're about to uh, be proven wrong. There's actually an article in Haaretz in December 1936. Now that my wife left Haaretz, I could say something about it. <laughs> in difficult times, we must use any help we can get. They wrote a whole article that says, really, you know, rabbis really belong in the shul. But in today's day and age, we may need to use a rabbi. We need to get all the help we could get to promote the idea of Zionism. If it has to be an Orthodox rabbi with a few PhDs from the Sorbonne who actually speaks good English, unlike most of the other leaders of the issue, and he could speak to the British and get the respect of world leaders, we're willing to take his help. Now you have to understand, Rav Kook comes to Israel in 1904, how many Jews live in Jaffa? He becomes the rabbi of Jaffa. He has five, 6,000 Jews, it's a small community. When Rav Herzog becomes the chief rabbi in Israel, there are already 384,000 Jews living in Israel. So he becomes a rabbi of one of the big Jewish communities in the world. Maybe you have a little bit more Jews in the Lower East Side than the entire state of Israel at that time, but that's besides the point. No How many non-Jews live? What? No state. No state. I'm sorry. There's no state of Israel. It's just the land of Israel. How many non-Jews live in Israel? Close to a million. The Jews are only 28% of the population in Israel at that time. Ha-pala. The British promised, we discussed the Balfour Declaration in our last uh, in our last talk, yes, we have a great idea, we'll promote Zionism, you know, this is a great solution for some time in the future. The future is getting pushed off for another year, another year, another decade. And the question is, what do you do? How do you bring Jews into Israel? What did the British do? They give a michsot. They gave an amount of certificates of official people they're allowed to bring into the land of Israel, which is definitely not enough if you want to create a Jewish state, you need to change the 28% of the population. If you stay 28% of the population, there's never going to be a Jewish state in Israel, and they understand that. The question is, how do you bring people into the, into the country? So between 1934 and 1939, which is the first period of Herzog as chief rabbi, the mainstream leadership of the Yishuv wants to do everything legal. The revisionists, uh, with the leadership of Le Zev Jabotinsky, um, they're bringing Jews illegally which creates a very big problem. You have a lot of illegal Jews in Israel that could be deported at any time. In 1939, Ben-Gurion changes his mind and he's because of World War II and he agrees to make efforts to bring Jews illegally into the land of Israel. How many of you have heard of the White Papers in 1939? The St. James Conference, the the, it's called the Round Table Conference. It's called the St. James, James Conference because it took place in the St. James um, Palace. The British have a problem. You know, the, the Arabs don't want to talk to the Jews. The Jews uh, don't mind talking to the Arabs, but they have an agenda to have a state uh, established. The Arabs do not want any more Jews coming to the country. The Jews want to bring in more Jews uh, uh, into the country. Um, and they come to a set of negotiations. Not much happens. Rav, Cook is, uh, Rav Herzog is also on the Jewish delegation uh, discussing uh, the cause of the Jewish people. It does not uh, lead to great success. 
they limit all Jews who could come only 75,000 for a long amount of years, which is not going to change the demographics in the country. Um, and basically, it's going to lead into an Arab state with a pretty large Jewish population. So basically, you're back to having like a, you know, a little bigger shtetl than you had in Poland. And the Jewish population in Israel is very, very upset. We spoke about Sarah Herzog. Now, this is a demonstration of women in Jerusalem right after the white paper uh, was announced, that, that policy. Now, you see Sarah Herzog. Do you, know, uh, do you recognize her? This is in May 22, 1939. Sarah Herzog with the wife of um, educator Yellen, hand in hand. Now, look at this. This is a close-up. Sarah Herzog is the woman to the right. You're not messing with Sarah Herzog. You see that look over there? <laughs> Rav Herzog himself also uh, speaks at a demonstration. And what does he do? He takes the white paper after at the end of his speech and he rips it into two. When is that going to be used again in history? Amen. Chief Rabbi Herzog's son, Chaim Herzog, correct, Dr. Reich, became later on the president of Israel. 1975, the UN comes out with a declaration that Zionism equals racism. Rev, uh, Chaim Herzog, President Chaim Herzog, then ambassador, gives the speech of his life, uh, ridiculing the decision, and what does he do at the end of that speech? He does exactly what his father did. He rips the paper into two. Um, again, just to show you how history repeats itself in different ways, in 1975. We'll come back to the family in a moment. What's happening? So how do you get into Israel? So there's one way, is the legal way. There are a certain amount of certificates, and if you want to get approved, if you want to come as a Jew into Israel, you need the Sukhnut, you need the Zionist establishment to welcome you. Now, who does the Zionist establishment want in the country? Secular. Young. Secular. Young people. Why do they want young people? Workers. Workers. They want people who are going to build another kibbutz, another yeshuv. People are going to work the land. People are going to fight in the Haganah. They're not looking for rabbis. They're not looking for yeshiva boys. They're not looking for different types of population that may not be part of their idea. The Zionist establishment has a very clear goal. They want to create a Jewish state. And they have a very clear idea of who are those people who are going to help them create the Jewish state. Now, what's the other way of getting into Israel? Is sneaking into the country and getting married. Have you heard of that idea? There are an estimated 20,000 Jews who were illegally uh, in Israel at the time. And a lot of them, look, look how many divorces, look how many marriages you have in 1937. You have 4,800 marriages, and you have 20, almost 2,800 divorces. Now what does that mean? That either means there's a very bad Shalom bias, <laughs> or in 1937, you know, the Jews are one third of the population in Israel. The Arabs have one-third of those amount of divorces. The Arabs have only 1,000 divorces in the entire year. What does it mean? What do these numbers mean? If you have to read them and, uh, and analyze what's happening. People are getting married for one sake, to stay in Israel. Is that okay according to Jewish law? Is it okay just to get married just for, for the fact? And who has to sign a marriage certificate? Who has to approve it? is Rabbi Herzog was very lenient in allowing people to have that marriage certificate just to be able to stay in the land of Israel. The Zionist leadership is very angry at him because they're not interested necessarily because very often those people will, will be instead of the quota that, you know, for every person Rabbi Herzog is signing in, there is another strong young guy in Warsaw who's not going to make Aliyah. So that creates a point of tension. Rav Herzog, um, he's approached by many people. You have to understand, it's very interesting. Rav Herzog is one of the few celebrities in Israel who's, uh, you know, he's the easiest person to approach. You know, people call me up and say, Rabbi Goldschmidt, can you get us a meeting with Rabbi Schneier? I called the assistant, I can't get a meeting, it's too difficult. I said, I have a very simple suggestion for you. Come Shabbat morning to services, come down to Kiddush, wait in line, you'll have a meeting with Rabbi Schneier. At the end of the day, if you need to find the rabbi, you know where to find him. He's in shul. He's there. All you have to do, you could, that's the best way to get a meeting. 
And Rav Herzog has this one-on-one -on -one communication with people. He is, you know, he's walking, again, you have to understand the difference between Rav Kook and Rav Herzog. Rav Kook is dressed with a more Eastern European look. Rav Herzog is walking with a cylinder hat, you know, is not so much part of the uh, Sabra uh, culture, you know, with the shirts out and, you know, no socks and sandals. Rav Herzog is dressed like this uh, British aristocrat in the, uh, planted in the Middle East, which makes him, a, you know, very unusual in the, in the scenery of Israel. Okay, I'm not sure what this is. 1939, the Rivenstrop Molotov um, Pact. Um, I'm sure all of you know who, uh, uh, what this is. This is the shocking news came out to the world that the Nazis and the Soviets have made a non-aggression pact for 10 years. Uh, besides for the non-aggression pact, uh, the Germans knew uh, the very smartly, um, uh, you know, were able to mislead Stalin. They knew that they can't wage a world war we're having with the Russians against them at the beginning. Uh, later on, they wouldn't mind. They knew that they would face them earlier or later, but not at the very beginning. You could see Stalin looking at the back. Um, so it's Joachim von Riventrop and Vacheslav Molotov uh, are signing the agreement. Now, this agreement had a very interesting effect. They split Poland into two. You see, uh, you see Poland split into two. The red side is obviously Russian. Um, the the, the other side, the black side, is the, the Nazis. And part of the agreement, a fascinating thing, is that Vilna was under the control of Poland for 20 years. Vilna was going to return to Lithuania, become independent for a short while. Why did the Russians agree to it? You know, there was an open part of the agreement, there was a sealed part of the agreement. The bottom line is, Vilna becomes an independent city for a short while. What happens? Now, we're going to discuss what Rav Herzog did during World War II, which is fascinating. But we'll start with what happened with the yeshiva world. Now, how big is the yeshiva world in 1937? And when I speak the yeshiva world, I speak all the yeshivot, all the kolo students, all the rabbis, all the scholars, everything. Put everyone together. How many people we're talking about? We're speaking about 2,400 people. Just to give you a difference today, we're speaking about 150,000 people in Israel alone. Just to understand the difference in magnitude. The yeshiva world is this, um, is this small enterprise that's based mainly in Lithuania that was able to find some sort of answer to the enlightenment to create a holes of study that will encourage Jewish uh, study and spiritual growth. Those yeshivot go to Lithuania. They realize that's their only hope to survive. The, the communists are atheists. The, the Nazis are definitely up to no good. During, uh, we're speaking about 1939, 1940, you have uh, almost all of them are gathered in Vilna. Rav Herzog sends in 1938, he already writes to them, come to the land of Israel, no good is going to happen in Europe. He's ignored. So now he has to help out. Now everyone are sending letters to Chief Rabbi Herzog, please help, get us out of Vilna. Now how do you get out of Vilna when you have the Russians on one side and the Germans on the other side? Which, uh, which is very problematic. These are their certificates. Again, Rav Herzog could, could wing a few certificates. He offered to Rav Lazar Yudha Finkel to the heads of the institutions. Many of them did not want to leave their flock behind. Those who did, it's a separate discussion of what the, the details but he can't get enough certificates to get the entire um, yeshiva world out of Lithuania. And he's, he's concerned this might be an end to Torah Jewry. This might be an end. These 2,400 people are the backbone of the Jewish spiritual world. He goes to London and he has plenty of meetings. And he meets a person, Ambassador Ivan Maisky. Ivan Maisky is the ambassador of the Soviet Union in London at the time. And he thinks Maisky may be a Jewish name. So he walks into the meeting and he says, Shema Yisrael Hashem Lokein Hashem Echad. Tries to shake up the Jewish, the Jewish guilt. So, the Jewish guilt. Guess what? He's not Jewish. <laughs> and he's trying to convince an atheist to save 2,400, a few hundred students. And right now, mainly speaking to the head of the Mir Yeshiva. 
the head of the Mir Yeshiva is willing to follow him directly into where he goes. There are other people who are involved. He goes to fundraise money in the United States. But how is he going to get them out of Lithuania? There are two fascinating people at that point in Kovna, in Lithuania, both consul generals. There's one yeshiva student in the Mir Yeshiva who happens to be a Dutch citizen. He runs to the consul general of Holland in Kovna, and he begs him, please let me get out of here, give me a visa. And he says, I'm sorry, I can't help you. He says, you have to do something for me. And he, guess what he says? You know, I could give you a visa. The Dutch at that point have a, have a colony called Curacao. Here's a visa to Curacao. Now what do you do with a visa to Curacao when you're stuck in Lithuania in 1940? Yeah, there's no crews coming out of Vilna to go to Curacao. As they say in Yiddish, it's Asher Yotzar Papir, which means toilet paper. You can't do anything with it. But together with a few other people, they get visas for the entire um, yeshiva to go to Curacao. Now, how do you get there? They find another person who is Hasideu Motolam. There are people, there are a lot of non-Jewish people who stepped up to the plate during those years and have saved Jews. These are two of some of the most special um, Gentiles who've, uh, uh, who've uh, stood up for the Jewish people during that time. And Sugiara is the Japanese consul general in Lithuania. Now, why did the Japanese need a consul general in Lithuania? In many reasons, they, they, just, they recently opened up the consulate. Maybe they wanted to have a closer to the front to know what's happening with the Russians and the Germans for spying reasons. There are a lot of other discussions. Sugiara, the Jap Japanese are allies of the Nazis. But he gives them a transit visa to Japan. Transit, one second, listen to this based on their visas to Curacao. Now, if you learn geography for 10 minutes in your life, you know that if you're, in, if you're in Vilna and you need to get to Curacao, you don't need to go through Japan. But that doesn't matter. That, pr that proves what he did. It's a long discussion. Ivan Maisky delivers. He agrees to give a transit visa through the Soviet Union for the students of the yeshiva. But the Russians, as Russians do, Abyssal Gelt, $200 per student. They, they pay $200 per student. Rav Herzog is involved in raising the money. It's not easy for him to raise that money. Once they pay $200 in, 1930, in 1940, $200 is a lot of money. In the middle of the war, it's an enormous amount of money. They become the first class tourists. They pass through Moscow, they stay at the in tourist hotel, then they go on the Trans Siberian railways throughout Russia and end up in Japan. It's a long story, but I'll discuss a little bit later. You know, these figures we chose are radical rabbinic uh, figures. The traditional Haredi establishment has a lot of problems with them. A doctor, a Sorbonne, a Ive, um, very close, uh, they're Zionistic, which to the traditional rabbinic establishment was very radical at that point. But Rav Herzog gets the least flack for it for a very simple reason. He actually saved their lives. He saves the lives of the Hasidic leaders, of the Ger Rebbe, of the Belzer Rebbe, of the Babava Rebbe, of the Mir Yeshiva. The, spirit, the spiritual world of Eastern Europe, what survives of it, not all, a lot of them were perished, but a lot of those who survived are thanks to the efforts of Rav Herzog. Again, the people who joined them is Rabbi Dr. Hertz, Chief Rabbi of Great Britain, uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rav Chaim Nechum, the Rabbi of Cairo at that time, uh, the Vada Tzala in, in, in uh, the United States. A lot of people helped out, and I'm not excluding anyone, but he was a leading figure in this process. You know who this person is. Rav Herzog comes to the United States, and at this point, he's starting to beg for the Jewish people. The yeshiva he saved was a project but they're starting to get information about the Jews being killed throughout Europe. And many people say that Rav Herzog really, the moment he walked out of FDR's office, his hair turned white. And he realized that he's not going to help. And what Rav Herzog does during World War II, 
you have to understand an aristocratic person he's a very calm human being he's like this you know if he, people refer to Rav Cook as an angel people refer to him as a prince as as you know a very he begs he goes begging for the Jewish people he knocks on any door that may open halfway or partway and one of those doors is FDR and FDR is very impressed by him by the way to all of them he speaks in a beautiful English he quotes from the scriptures a lot of these leaders are are believers Christians believe in the Bible he has very little success at this time have you heard the name of Erwin Romo <laughs> the desert fox of the Nazis who is going through northern Africa and is at the gates of Israel. People are telling Tarev Herzog, stay in the United States, don't go back to Israel. Israel is going to fall down. And he goes on what some say is the last boat back to Israel. I'm the rabbi of the country. I'm the rabbi of the Jewish people in the, in the land of Israel. I'll be back with them. And he says one of the most, one of the greatest speeches of his life, when he comes back to Israel, he says, Churban Rishon, Nibua Nevi'im. Churban Sheni, Nibua Nevi'im. Churban Shlishi Lo Shaman. The prophets have told us about the destruction of the first temple. They've told us of the destruction of the temple, second temple. But nowhere it says anything about destruction of the third house, the third temple. And he refers to Israel as the third temple. Israel will not be destroyed again. He goes back to Israel. And, you know, in a time when there's very little you could do, the most important job of a leader is to bring hope. It's that word, that tikva. Miraculously, um, Montgomery, uh, Marshall Montgomery, who actually fought the Irish, uh, you know, um, for the British, is able to stop Romo at the gates of Israel. And eventually the Americans and the English push them from two sides of North Africa and get the Nazis outside of, um, of North Africa. What would happen if the Germans would come into Israel? You don't want to think about it. There's a, the Haganah already had plans. It was called the Carmel Plan. Um, but we do not want to think about the consequences that would happen if that, would, if that were to happen. He goes in 1942. He wants to meet with the Pope. Rabbi Herzog believes that if the Pope will take a stand, and who's the Pope at that time? Pius, the not so pious, the 12th. And he tries to get a meeting. Who does he use? He tries to use uh, Cardinal uh, Joseph McCroy, who was the Cardinal of Ireland. He has a relationship from Ireland with him. He was a very, uh, he built a lot of relationships the Pope will not see him. Again, in 1942, he meets with Angelio Giuseppe Roncalli in Turkey, who later becomes a Pope himself, uh, John uh, Johann XXIII. He does not get a meeting with the Pope. Just some of his other efforts. In uh, February 1944, he goes again to Turkey, trying to see if he can save the Jews of the Balkans. No success. On May, September 1944, he approaches the Americans with Rabbi Uziel on any occasion he can, no success. September 5, he meets with Father Hughes in Cairo. He leaves Israel to Turkey, to Cairo, to London, to the United States, knocking on any door he can, trying to save Jews. But this is probably the most painful of all of them. Do you remember Eamon de Valera? He is now the leader of Ireland. He is the person who was saved because he hid at the home of Chief Rabbi Herzog. Rabbi Herzog hid him when he was under danger because of, the, because of his revolution against the British. And Rabbi Herzog um, dangered his life in order to save his life. And he turns to him. Now I'm asking for the Jews. Please help me. And what is his response? October 1938, after Jewish doctors are banned from, uh, from practicing in the Third Reich, he asked to let them into Ireland. No, 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 no. I just, I wrote two quotes. The first one is from the letter that Rav Herzog writes to him. Revered friend, pray no stone unturned to save tormented remnant of Israel, doomed Allah to utter an annihilation in Nazi Europe. And the response, you tell me what this response means. Tell me if you'd be optimistic after this response. 
I know you, you will believe that everything we can do as a neutral statue prevents or alleviates suffering anywhere we shall do to the utmost of our power. You know what that means? It's what we call GMG. Gurnish <laughs> Bitnisht. He reaches out to him in December 1942. These are some of the records we have. He reaches out to him in January 1943. He reaches out to him in July 1943. He reaches out to him in April 5, 1944. He reaches out in December 1944 to his friend. And he goes nowhere. He asks him, speak to the Pope. Speak to him. He asks the Pope, he asks cardinals, please tell the Pope to send out a letter that ministers and monasteries throughout Europe should save Jews, to encourage them to save Jews. Please call up Hitler. And this is the person he does not get the meeting with, Pius XII. The entire war, he's begging for a meeting with him. He does not get a meeting with him. When does he get a meeting with him? After the war ends. Finally, he's willing to see him. After the war ends, you know, a lot of people are involved, you know, during efforts of the war. The war ends, or if Herzog is just getting started. He wants to save Jews who are in DP camps. He travels for six months. All the doors that were closed to him during the war are now starting to finally open. Every country he goes to, he meets with the presidents, with the prime ministers, with the kings, the queens, the dukes, and he asks them, demands, I want visas, I want you to pay for the transportation, I want to save children. But most importantly, he goes to the Pope and he says, we know that many Jewish parents gave their children to churches and monasteries throughout Europe. Their parents were killed in the camps. Give them back to the Jewish people. Send out a letter. Give me a list of children. He says, there's no such children. He says, I'll give you a list. Well, after he gave them a list, guess, guess what happened to all those kids? They were hidden even better. He gets no help from the Pope on that matter. You know, people, historians discuss what could have the Pope done. He could have done a lot. How much could have he done? Could have he saved everyone? Probably not. But that's probably one of the darkest moments in the history of the Catholic Church. It's called the Masa'at Salah. He doesn't turn, he doesn't leave any stone, not one stone unturned. He gets, there's a debate amongst historians how many children he actually saved. The estimates are anywhere, anywhere between 500 and 2,000 children that he saved. When Eastern Europe when the um, borders were starting to close and Jews wanted to run away from Soviet occupation, he fought to keep uh, the borders open in the Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia, and other countries at that time. Other estimates say that just because of the DP camps that he encouraged to open, he saved uh, tens of thousands of more Jews. The, one of the most famous stories, you know, it's a legend, so I can't tell you if it happened is that one of the monasteries he walks into, and I shared this at a Yom Kippur sermon five years ago, my first uh, sermon I gave the High Holidays at Park East. He walked into a monastery and they told him there are no Jewish children. He said, I want to meet all the kids. And they put all the kids into an auditorium. And he knows he has two minutes with the children. And he picks up his hand and he covers his eyes and he says, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. And, every, and he, then he looks at every child who picked up his hand. He says, those children are Jewish children. I don't need their passports. I don't need their family names. Those kids are Jewish kids. Again, I can't tell you the authenticity of the story. They don't tell that story about me. So I can tell you that. <laughs> he goes from DP camp, from one camp to another. There's stories that in one camp he's saying the song Ani Maman for three hours with survivors. He, he does everything he can, he could do. For six months, he's traveling. So he's the chief rabbi of the land. There are half a million Jews in Israel at this point. Six months, he goes from town to town, from DP camp to DP camp, from May until September of the next year, tries, trying to save Jews. Where's this photo taken? This is the remnants of the Warsaw Ghetto. This is one of the most painful photos for me in this presentation. The last time he was in Poland, before, as a child, as a nine-year-old kid, when he saw the Jewish world in its height, and he's going back to Warsaw, and this is what he sees, this is what's left. And he's the rabbi of the land of Israel. This is, for in many ways, the last answer. 
and he feels that awesome responsibility. This is him at the first sign, the first place of the fighters of the Warsaw Ghetto, at the, with some other people, I don't know if they're Jewish or not. The person who goes with him to many of those places is San Yaakov Herzog, who we'll speak about in a moment. The state of Israel comes into existence. And now, imagine if you're of Herzog. If you're the person who was knocking on every single door that was closed, if you were the person who begged the person who you saved his life to help some Jews and got zero, not one Jew was saved through Ireland during World War II. Not one Jew he didn't accept, even de Valera. And now you're privileged enough to see the state of Israel come into existence. We'll try to guess if you'll be a pro-Zionist or not pro-Zionist. What's the definition? Now he comes, there's so, I, 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 the reason I feel bad about this presentation is I feel like I'm not going to do justice to his intellectual genius. He wrote so much about the laws of how to be able to create a Jewish state. But one of the first discussions is regarding um, the laws of the War of Israel. And there was a question in, in the city of Tiberia. They wanted to build a Gedder Bidachon. They were scared that Arabs would attack. They wanted to build a fence to protect. So Rabbi Werner, the rabbi of Tiberia, said, he was debating, is it, are we in danger already? Are we not in danger? Um, you know, he looked at it a lens halachically through Hatzalat Nefashot. If you're in danger of life, of course you could work on Shabbat. But if it's not the danger of human life, then you can't work on the Sabbath. And Rav Herzog refutes his claims one to one. First of all, he said, the people who will decide if there's a danger or not is not you, Rabbi Werner, with all due respect. Those are the military generals. That's number one. Number two, he says, uh, saving lives is not only, you're not, I'm not going to wait again to see people attack Jewish people. I'm not waiting for one more person's life to be spilled. So if we're going to do preventive, we're going to prevent um, as much as we can, even if it is on Shabbat. And when he's asked by Tuvia Beer, the leader of the Ezra movement, are religious youngsters, are they allowed to, um, uh, you know, join the Haganah and work on the Sabbath? You know, some of them, just the job could be just uh, standing at a checkpoint and opening on a flashlight and looking who's passing. Not necessarily when there's a danger of human life, just different things. And he responds a very interesting thing. He says, the wars of Israel is milchemet mitzvah. This is a war of mitzvah. We are back to the category that were during the times of King David. We're back to those days. He reinstates laws that were not practiced for thousands of years. And he says, to start a milchemet mitzvah, you need to have a king. You need to have a Sanhedrin. We don't have a king. He reinterprets law and he says, a democratic ruled country that's, uh, that's voted by the majority of the people, those leaders have a status of a king. A king is someone who is accepted upon his nation. And therefore, they have the permission to start a war of mitzvah. This is a beautiful quote of Herzog. This is very much essence of what he believes. The state of Israel did not only save Jews, it saved Judaism. When he goes through those six months traveling through Europe, he sees that the Jewish spirit is dead. He sees that Jewish pride is gone. And he sees that the state of Israel is the hope to bring back that Jewish pride. It's that hope to be able to give pride in being Jewish again. He is the one who authors the prayer for the government of Inu Shabbat that we say every single week. There's a debate, maybe Shai Gnon did it. No. Rav Herzog is the one who writes it. It's approved by Rav Uziel, who's the Sephardic chief rabbi. And Shai Gnon is just edits it. But he's the one who puts the prayer together. When the question is, should we say Halal on Yom Atzmaut? He said to say without a blessing. He was hoping that the Haredim will also say Halal if they don't say Abracha. He was naive when it came to that. It's important to mention, Rabbi Uziel is the Sephardic chief rabbi at that time. He was a great partner. He deserved a, lectures, a lecture on his own, but together they have done a lot of things. And he starts to reinstate the chief rabbinate. For example, the Ketuvah. How much is a Ketuvah? When you signed the Ketuvah, how many people here got married? <laughs> so go back and take a look. Ask the husbands, ask your wife for the permission to take a look at the Ketuvah. It says 200 zuz. How does it mean? So they put them out. 50 liras. 50 liras in those times was the nicest sum of money. Till when do you have to support your children? Listen to this. You know, Talmudically, is it till the age of six? Till the, to, you know, you have to support them till the age of 15. 
I'm sure many parents here are willing to sign on that as well. It means you don't have to support them after that age. Chalitza. There's some communities when a, a woman dies without having children. When, I'm sorry, when a man dies, they yell. When a man dies without having children, his wife needs to either go through chalitza or yipum, as discussed in Deuteronomy. Again, they reenact. There's a discussion amongst uh, different opinions. There's no such thing as zibum. The brother cannot marry the wife of the deceased, uh, uh, of his deceased brother, and therefore she gets a chalitza. Again, very interesting. How long is polygamy forbidden in the Jewish people? Depends. If you're an Ashkenazi Jew, it's for a thousand years. <laughs> Not all Sephardic communities accepted upon themselves that right away. That became the, the norm, but it wasn't officially accepted as a, as a community obligation. One of the things, together with Rav Uziel, Rav Herzog establishes, no such thing as polygamy. So Israel is a legal monogamous country. Very interesting. Rav Herzog establishes the Yom HaKadosh Klali, the first memorial to the Holocaust, two and a half years before the state of Israel establishes its own Yom HaShoah Gvura. And there was a question, why do you, when do you say Kaddish for a relative that died in the Holocaust and you do not know when to say the Kaddish? And they made the 10th day of Tevet, which is already a fast day. There's a lot of discussion in it. But uh, the 27th day of Kislev, 1950, he establishes the Yom HaKadosh Klali, uh, the day of Kaddish, for the Jewish people. The state of Israel only follows later. There's a huge, the leaders of the Zionist movement did not view with a positive eye the whole European Jew who went like, um, like they called, like sheep to the slaughter. And therefore it takes more time in, until it becomes, um, you know, and also there are many debates until it comes into law in 1953. When he was attacked by right-wing rabbis, the students told him, why don't you respond? You're a brilliant scholar. Why don't you fight back? And he said, we're still recovering from the wars of Rav Yonas and Ibishas and Rav Yaakov Amtin, which happened 300 years earlier. Which he meant to say that he was very against, he was a very non, um, non-confrontational. He's very opinionated, but he was a very calm, very gentle person. Whenever there was a question of an aguna, happened a lot during the war. The husband was gone. And there's no bill of divorce and there's no proof that he died. How could he allow the woman to remarry? You know, so technically, if a rabbi signs and allows a woman to remarry, technically anyone could do it. The problem is to get the whole rabbinic establishment to agree to what you said. And he had that consensus. He made sure whenever he signed in a, a, a question for Naguna, he built a coalition. Because he didn't just want to allow the woman to remarry. He wanted that woman, no matter where she goes, if she goes to Satmar, if she goes to Williamsburg or to Bar Park, she'll be able to remarry. There's a story of him once he signed a permission for a woman to remarry a few minutes before Shabbat. And he gave his assistant, he told him, go get the other rabbis to sign on it as well. He said, Rabbi, I'm, I need to take a shower. Shabbos is coming in in a few minutes. He says, you'll take a shower next week before Shabbos. <laughs> he gets him and he signs the Aguna Heter, an Arab Shabbat. That same Shabbat, the other rabbi passed away. So he was able to get that woman remarried. He cared up the personal pain of each human being was very close to his heart. These are his two sons. President Chaim Herzog was born in, Bel- uh, was born in Ireland and Yaakov Herzog. Chaim Herzog learned in my alma mater, the Chavrin Yeshiva. He was not known to be a great scholar in the Talmud. He did not continue his father's path in the rabbinate. Being a rabbi's son is not an easy thing, let me tell you that. <laughs> I went, I remember, I went with my father to Rav Shapiro, who was later the chief rabbi of Israel, and he told the story of how he became his first appointment as becoming a judge in Israel. He was appointed by Rav Herzog to be a judge. After he was appointed, Sarah Herzog, the mother of Chaim, who was nervous that he's not too serious in yeshiva, told him, I want you to tutor him. So that was part of the, part of the deal. He had to tutor Chaim Herzog. It didn't keep him in yeshiva for much longer. <laughs> Yaakov Herzog follows the more traditional path. He gets rabbinic ordination for Rabbi Mr. Zalman Meltzer. He's a brilliant scholar, but he's also a great diplomat. He's the one who walks with Rav Herzog to all the doors of power during World War II. Um, this is, these are his two sons with Rav Herzog in the background. This is Chaim Herzog and his mother, Sarah. 
Yaakov Herzog becomes the ambassador of Israel to Canada. And this is a very famous debate he had with a very uh, anti, anti, anti-Semitic uh, historian, Ar- Arnold Toynbee. We're almost, we're almost finished, dear friends. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah. Keep going. <laughs> he gets the ability to communicate from his father. He gets the rigorous knowledge. Again, he's a brilliant man. Um, he's torn his whole life. I read, it. this is a, his biography. And when I first read his biography at the age of 15, it's, I, I remember I read it, I couldn't leave the book. Um, I connected on a personal level. I don't want to be too pretentious. But he's a, he was a rabbi of a chief rabbi in Europe. He was a son of a chief rabbi in Europe. And he was torn his whole life between going into the rabbinate and not going into the rabbinate. He was the only person in the history of the world who was offered two jobs at the same time. To be the chief of staff of Prime Minister Eshkol's office and to be the chief rabbi of the United Kingdom. There are very few people who could get those two offers at the same time. He had the brilliance to take care of both. He chose to be the chief of staff of Levi Eshkol. But for the rest of his life, he was torn. He was never calm. He died at a young age. He was, uh, he was a very promising the leader. Life, he was torn about. Whether he should go into the rabbinate or not. Whether he should go into the rabbinate or continue as a diplomat. Professor Zev Lev is, uh, again, these are stories I heard from the grandson of Rabbi Isaac Herzog, Dr. Isaac Herzog, that's his name, he's named after his grandfather. Zev Lev was uh, the founder of the Lev College in Jerusalem. And he told him that Rav Herzog on Mondays and, 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 and Wednesdays he would v- usually officiate weddings. Tuesdays and Thursday nights, they would get together and they had a deal. Rav Herzog would teach Professor Lev Talmud for two hours, and Professor Lev would teach Rabbi Herzog nuclear physics for two hours. And then they had a Kabbalist come study with them Kabbalah until the early hours of the morning. Just so you understand the, the level of this human being. Okay. Uh, Dr. Isaac Herzog, tell me, share me a little bit about personal, who he was as a person. These two, what's the, the picture on the um, matzo ball soup? Now, what's matzo ball soup? When do you eat matzo ball soup? So if you're Jewish, you eat it on Pesach. If you're very Jewish, you eat it every day. But what's the problem with matzo ball soup? It's gibrachs. So if you're a, a Litvak like, like myself, if you're not a Hasidic Jew, eat gibrachs. It's one of the greatest pleasures of being Jewish, having matzo brai. Those who are not lucky enough to eat gibrachs and do not eat matzo brai on Pesach, don't eat it. Or if Herzog, even though he, was, he, he didn't have a Hasidic blood in him, he was careful not to eat Gebrux himself. But the story is, he would never impose his restrictions on his family or on other people. He was a very moderate halachic decisor for the country and for the nation. But personally, he was very strict on himself. So no one even knew about it. But he had a separate set of dishes on Passover from his family on which he did not eat Gebrux. The second thing, Dr. Isaac Herzog told me that when they're fixing his apartment as a child, he went to sleep by his grandmother's home. And his grandmother, Sarah Herzog, never changed since her husband died. She left everything the way it used to be. And when he woke up in the morning, he tripped over this bowl. Nagelvas. And what was it? And his grandmother told him, you know, when you wake up in the morning, you're supposed to wash your hands. There are many reasons for it. Um, for cleanliness, for, for ritual purity, before you start praying. So technically, you could go to the bathroom and wash your hands. That's what I do. But if you're really religious, you get uh, the Nagel Vasa right by your bed. Because as soon as you wake up, you clean your hands. Again, this is not something you would expect from him. And he never told anyone, he never expected anyone else to do it, but he did it on himself. Again, to show you, he was a very complex person. He wore two pairs of tefillin. There's Rashi and Rabbeinu Ta'ala. He didn't wear it like this. He wore them separately, one after the other. But he didn't want anyone to know about it. He had a minion in his home. After the, the minion finished, he would go upstairs and put on the second pair of tefillin there. He didn't want people to know that he's trying to be pious. He was very modest about his piety, as my wife says. Modesty is, uh, uh, you know, is a tricky word. He was modest about his, uh, his piety. He didn't want people to know, and he did not impose it uh, on his children. Joseph Gutman, are you with me? So we have a privilege to have with us um, someone who's been to an event that I'll discuss right now. 
The state is founded. And who's the first prime minister? Ben-Gurion. Ben-Gurion, a part of the discussion of, of how the state is going to work together, how the secular and the religious going to figure it out, he's told by the two religious Knesset members, two of the religious Knesset members, that they follow the instruction of a Jew by the name of Chazon Ish. Chazon Ish, similarly to Rabbi Herzog, did not learn in yeshiva, also a self-taught human being, uh, who, who comes to Israel, and he is the father of the Haredi world in Israel the way we know it today. And Ben-Gurion is curious to have a meeting with him. And probably when we discuss the state of Israel, this is probably one of the most formative meetings that happened there. And on October, this is the Chazonish, this is how he hated people taking pictures of him. So he's turning the other way, you see a child trying to block the camera. You know, a few people stuck a few pictures of him, but again, he never had any official position. He was purely respected for the genius he was. This is a picture of Ben-Gurion walking into his home. Joe Gutman, who was a student at the Panavish Yeshiva, along with hundreds of other, hundreds or some people say thousands, gather around the home to see what's going to happen. The leader of the secular Jewish world, David Ben-Gurion, is coming to speak for the first time with the leader of the traditional Jewish world, the Chazonish. The, Jew, the religious world is not too powerful at that moment. But again, it's interesting that Ben-Gurion gives him the respect to come to him. Doesn't ask him because Chazonish didn't ask for the, you know, the one who asked for the meeting is the one who has to show up. Ben-Gurion wears, he doesn't wear a kippah. What does he wear? And, you know, he can't push it too much. He can't push it too much. You know, he's, he's, well, he's willing to cover his, his head, but he's not, he's not putting on a shrimp. He comes, there's only one other person at the meeting, Yitzchak Navon, who later becomes the president of Israel. Ben-Gurion talks to him and he asks him a question. How are we going to live here together? And the Chazinish responds with a story, a mashal, that became very famous in Israeli folklore by religious and non-religious alike. He quotes from a Talmud in Sanhedrin. What happens when you have two camels who have to pass a bridge and they bumped into each other? Who has the right of passage? Which camel goes first? You know what's the answer? How does one decide which of them should go first? The one that's laden, the one, the full camel, the camel that's carrying on it the burden goes first. The empty camel goes last. And he turns to Ben-Gurion and he says, we are the wagon. We are, he says, the Agalah HaMele'ah and the Hagalah Rika. You know, it's, it's pretty, you know, into his face. He says, we are the wagon that's full of mitzvot and Torah, and you are an empty wagon. You're cutting off 2,000 years of Jewish history. You want to erase the exiled Jew of Eastern Europe. And Ben-Gurion is not too happy with that response. He says, we're an empty wagon? <laughs> we're saving your lives. We're fighting for you. That's empty? We're living, we're settling the land of Israel. That's an empty wagon? Yitzchak Navon says it. it's a very contentious conversation, but very respectful. And they go back and forth. And none of them budges. Who is the Jew who's taking the nation forward? For the Chazunish, he doesn't care about countries or armies. The Jewish people have survived everything holding on to the Torah. No matter what happens, we will survive. And Begurion says, yes, that's how well you did in Europe during World War II. The Holocaust happened. If we don't build the state of Israel, you're not going to have any existence. But the Ben-Gurion agrees to allow the yeshiva students not to draft into the army. Let me ask you a question, why? Okay, Alan Burke says there weren't that many of them. How many are? How many you said were in, in, in Lithuania and Eastern Europe? How many asked to receive an exemption of serving in the State of Israel Army uh, once it was incepted uh, with the exemption of being yeshiva student. Less than 400. That's all that's left from the yeshiva world. So there are many different opinions. Some people say that the Chazanish said it's such a small number he didn't matter. The leaders of his party today and the one who was the leader of his party until a few uh, days ago was Isaac Herzog, the grandson of Chief Rabbi Herzog. 
says if Ben Gurion would know how many yeshiva boards would have today, he would never agree to this. <laughs> Let me give you my interpretation. You know why the meeting was successful between Ben Gurion and the Chazanish? Because each one of them looked into the eyes of the other and was 100% positive that they would fail. The Chazanish was sure. The Chazanish is the name of his, of his book. He's named after his book. He was sure that the state of Israel is not going to exist more than a few years. He looks at Ben-Gurion as a curios of history that's going to be gone within a few years. This is an experiment that's not going to last. We are holding the wagon with the weight of Judaism on it. And what does Ben-Gurion think? He looks at the Chazanish and he says, this person is going to be extinct. The world of, of Eastern Europe is gone. And the, I believe that Ben-Gurion did not want to be the one to close the door on the last yeshiva. He did not want to be the one to kill it. He wanted it to die a natural death. None of them believed that they would succeed. You know what's the funny thing? Both of them were wrong. Both of them succeeded. The secular Zionists built a strong state with all the problems. It thrives and it exists to this very day. And the religious world was able to rebuild itself from the ashes to a size that no one has ever imagined it would ever grow to. What's his legacy? This is at the opening of Heichal Shlomo, which is the house of the chief rabbinate. There's so much to share, but I can't. He wrote, he wrote many books, and one of the books he writes before he becomes the rabbi, of the chief rabbi of the land of Israel, is about um, uh, Jewish legal law, how to be able to create a state with Jewish law. Actually, when the Irish constitution was brought for him to review before it was brought in, this is... In 1958, a year before of Herzog dies, Ben Gurion has to deal with the question: "Me, who you de? Who's a Jew?" The, uh, I have one more minute. Is that okay? Yeah. Who's a Jew? He sends this question to 45, 46 people, uh, to the Chachmei Israel. He sends to uh, Shai Agnon, to the Lubavitcher Rebbe, to Chaim Azaz. Who is a Jew? How is the state of Israel going to define who's a Jew? By father, by mother, which conversions? How? It's already, it's, this is already the last, these are already the last uh, days of Rav Herzog. He gets different answers. 37 of the 46 tell him to stick with the traditional uh, viewpoint. Either born by, born by a Jewish mother or converted according to Orthodox law. You know when the reform movement first came to Ben-Gurion and complained to him, how come they're not accepted in Israel? You know what Ben-Gurion answered? No. I don't go to synagogue, but the synagogue I don't go to is not yours, it's theirs. <laughs> I didn't say anything, I'm just quoting Ben Gurion. <laughs> Rav Herzog dies on July 27th, 1959. Again, everyone show up. He's loved by everyone. He's one of the few people, him and his wife, were able to host in their home people from all walks of life, rich and poor, uh, the most ultra-Orthodox and the most secular. They connected world leaders with Israeli leaders. Someone who really uh, m made his mark on the Jewish people. This is him visiting a small yeshuv in Israel that's named after him, Masuot Yitzchak. You could see his cylinder hat walking do. He founded a center called the Talmudical Encyclopedia by Yad Arab Herzog, which is a huge work that's been created through his students. He identified some of the leading rabbis of the future generation. He put them, him and Sarah, put them in leading posts, both in the rabbinic courts. He built, there's so much to talk about, but I cannot. He heads, he also heads the function of uh, heading the Vada Yeshivot. It's a, he takes it as a personal mission to rebuild the Yeshiva world, even though he was never a Yeshiva student himself. This is his wife. After he dies in 1959, Sarah Herzog takes on the job and becomes the first president of Emuna, the world Mizrahi uh, women's organization. And uh, she is involved in enormous amounts of charities and projects and a lot of her great work is still recognized till this very day. This is, I want to complete with two photos, and this is one of them. You know, I think of Rav Herzog, first of all, he, you know, there are moments in our life that ask us to rise up to a certain occasion. Some of us do, some of us don't. He rose up to that occasion in his life. Whenever he had a calling, when he would realize that the Jewish people depended on him, he did not, he did not um, wither, he was strong. That's number one. The second thing that bothers me, you know, 
a person like Rav Herzog comes to the Jewish people once in a century or two centuries. How do you become a rabbi of a divine Torah if you're not a great person like Rav Herzog? If you look at this table, this is the, uh, the this is the head of rabbinic assembly. This is the Mu'etz the Rabbanut Rashid. You can see Rav Ovadia Yosef is the youngest guy sitting at this table uh, with a black, small black beard. Great scholars, um, amazing human beings, um, Rav Zevin, uh, Rav Uziel and others of enormous character, brilliance, people who had enormous both religious and secular knowledge, many of them. And how do you create a rabbinate, a chief rabbinate, where you have only one Rav Herzog, when you fill up posts with people, maybe a lot of them are mediocre. This is my last photo. It's the wagon. If Rav Herzog would be sitting at the meeting of the Chazunish and Ben Gurion, you know what he would say? Which wagon goes first? I think he would give an answer. He would say something else. I think he would say we're all on the same wagon. If we don't go in together, we're not going anywhere. And that was his life. He tried to put those two wagons together. Sometimes with more success, sometimes with less. But that is his main legacy. Thank you very much. So today you have 150 people who vote. All the chief rabbis of all the cities in Israel, uh, the mayors of Israel, uh, people who are appointed by the judiciary ministry, people appointed from the Ministry of Religious Affairs. Again, it was some sort of the form of the, of the governance body that the, the Yishuv, the new Yishuv had there in the state of Israel. Alan. Why did Ben-Gurion go to Chazanish and not to Herzog, who is the chief rabbi? Rav Herzog walks a thin line. The, the reason, you have to understand, uh, religious Zionism is still in its, in its very early stages. The way people, the Mizrahi is still in the diapers, basically. Um, the people, the, the fighters against the Zionist, um, Rav Herzog was one, the one who was trying to work with the Zionist movement. The, ultra, the Haredim were wor working against it in many ways. So if Ben-Gurion had to figure out how we we're going to live together, the one he has to speak to is the Chazanish. Thank you. Dr. Lefkowitz. <coughs> Robert Briscoe was the Jewish mayor of Delhi, and now I am Amen to Lera and Shemkat. How come he was not able to persuade <coughs> Valera to, to allow Jews to go? Great question. Dr. Lefkowitz is asking how come De Valera did not help or uh, uh, someone else affect, uh, what's his name? Robert Briscoe was the mayor. Robert Briscoe, how come Jewish. other people weren't able, he was, he was Jewish. Jewish. How come he wasn't able to influence De Valera? So again, you know, De Valera at the end of the day, the Irish were fighting the British. So in many ways they were neutral because they supported Hitler in many ways. Because they were fighting the, uh, for their independence. So. Um, you know, they did not want to annoy um, uh, the Nazis as well. And, you know, you realize how helpless the Jewish people were. My father told me this. My father told me when he came back from the, the, the 60th anniversary of the, of the of liberation of Auschwitz, uh, there was a huge event with Putin and world leaders. And my father was sitting at the event. I hope I quote you correctly because you can prove me wrong right now. Yeah. And besides for the Jews, there was, uh, there was a group of gypsies who were invited because gypsies were killed in Auschwitz as well, very few of them. And the gypsy leader of the gypsy world gypsy organization stands up and said, thank you, uh, Josh, for inviting us. Thank you, Moshe, for inviting us. I want to thank the Russians for inviting us. We want to thank the, uh, the British for inviting us. We want to thank the Americans for inviting us. They were just thanking people for being included. And my father says, if we wouldn't have the state of Israel, that's who we would be. 
what, what Israel changes is that we have a seat at the table. Um, the Pope will meet with Rabbi Herzog if that would happen after the creation of the State of Israel. And we don't remember what it was like not to have a state, what it's like not to have ambassadors, what it's like not to have the army. And, and you know, even good people um, who were friendly with Jews, a lot of them did not have the courage to stand up. But again, that doesn't answer your specific question because I don't know him personally and his motivations, but, but it's a great question. Can I Esther. I'm curious, was there a relationship between the uh, Chachamim, uh, like from the Alta, from Slobodka, oh. who sent people to America, the, 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 you know, the early leaders of uh, the Baltimore Yeshiva, etc., et was, was there a communication between those people or was... was with a, whom? With, with Herzog. Was he upset that he was starting something else in America? Was he promoting that? How did they feel about this whole idea of sending these pupils to America? So actually, it was, it was one of the fights when the Mir Yeshiva was saved through Shanghai, uh, through Japan and then Shanghai. You know, uh, the, one of the favorite stories is when the Japanese... Um, got noticed, the Nazis heard that the Japanese are hiding uh, many Jews in Japan. They demanded to return them to Europe. You know, the Japanese never met Jews before in their life. They, they, they didn't know how to tell a story. So he called over of Chaim Shmulevitz. He says, can I ask you a question? Why do the Nazis hate you so much? What did you do? He says, you know why they hate us? You have the best answer. Because we're Asians. <laughs> But the question was, where do they go from Shanghai? Do they go to the United States or do they go to Israel? Rav Kalmanovich, who was uh, also one of the directors of the Mir Yeshiva, went to the United States. Rav Herzog fought adamantly to bring them to Israel. Again, you know, there was a lot of politics. You know, even when they were saving Jews during the war, uh, Jewish organizations were fighting whose logo was going to be on the paper. So, uh, you know, but it was, uh, it, was, it was closely debated. Uh, Charlie, yes. In light of the fact that a week from tomorrow there's going to be a Jabotinsky memorial right here at Park East with uh, Danny Dayan, the ambassador, uh, Jabotinsky is on my mind. Did Herzog have any relationship with... Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you the truth, I don't know. Um, he definitely had a relationship with the, the revisionist movement. A lot of the people he helped uh, get legal status in the 1930s were the revisionists because the the, uh, the Haganah was not, did not was working with more closely with the British. The Jabotinsky people were the ones who were coming illegally. Um, so he definitely had a con He was helping them out in many ways to get those uh, fictitious marriages and, and, and weddings. Any other questions? Why did FDR turn back that boat over to That's another lecture. But, um, <laughs> you, you know, did the. Would the American community, did the American community do its best? Were we able to do anything? Um, again, but part of the way Jews behave in America today is because that there is a state of Israel. That's what Rav Herzog said. Israel did not just save Jews, it saved Judaism. You know, Jews see themselves differently in New York because there's a state of Israel. We lobby differently in Washington because there's an Israel. We walk with our backs straighter um, and more proudly because there's a state of Israel. Uh, I'll take one more question. Helen. Um, uh, Ellen. Religious what? The term religious scientist and modern orthodoxy. Are they the same? I mean, there's some religious Zionists who are ultra orthodox, some religious Zionists who are modern orthodox. There's some anti-Zionist anti religious or modern orthodox, and some, again, it's, it's very, as Jews, everything is always very complicated. But there are two, it's two separate, it, it doesn't have to relate. Um, what you mean usually religious Zionists is you believe that, you know, the Zionism, there's also two types of religious Zionists. There's the Messianic religious Zionist. Israel is part of the Atchata de Gula, it's part of the redemption. And then there's a practical religious Zionist. You know, I don't know if it's the redemption or not, but it's you know it's good we have a state of Israel. So th there are a lot of different a lot of different um, factions and, and ideologies. Thank you very much.